Welcome to Sub Briefs with Jive Turkey. Today's brief is going over the Gotland class A19 submarine, Sweden's carrier killer. This is a fantastic little design, a great diesel boat that has a unique feature. It has the history and the title of being the first air independent drive submarine used in modern warfare. So let's first go over our sources here. Uh, I always begin with hisutton.com. He's a really good website. He's got his facts down. He's very reliable. So uh, everything starts with him and then rolls on to other places like the National Archives I went through for this one. NTI.org is a new website that I just stumbled across. Of course, Saab Group, who makes the submarine, was invaluable for all the technical details, dates, and uh, times when things were made and changed on these hulls. Naval News, Naval Technology, and even the U.S. Navy's press releases were part of this. And, uh, you know, even went over some Google Images and got a couple off of that. So I recommend that you do if, check out these sources if you want to know more about the Gotland class submarines. Let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, our journey begins in Malmo, Sweden. That's it there on the very southern tip of Sweden, just north of Germany, east of Denmark. In Kulkum's shipyard, Malmo, Sweden. Now there's a couple different shipyards or naval construction facilities that they have in Sweden, but all three Gotland class submarines were made right here, right here in Malmo. So our journey begins in 1982. As with many other class of submarines, it begins with a study. It is what do we need to do next to improve our current Navy? So currently they have a diesel boat designed and built in the 1960s called the Sojourman, and it's now 1982, and you know the old diesel boat's starting to show her age, it's time to replace her. So they um, make a study to see what do they wanna do next? What do they wanna improve? Some of these things are sound silencing. A big one is undersea endurance, and that is what they tackle here. Calcums through the 1980s comes up with a radical new design that's never been done before in this way, an air independent propulsion system. Now, air independent propulsion can mean many different things. Uh, if, if it's just air independent, you could say, well, the battery that drives a diesel boat while submerged is air independent. And that would be technically true. A nuclear reactor that pushes an American nuclear submarine through the uh, ocean is air independent as well. Well, this is an air independent propulsion system that uses a combustion Stirling engine and not just a motor or motor generator. So what this is, what makes this unique is that it uses a liquid fuel, diesel fuel basically, and liquid oxygen. It then is added into some helium and nitrogen to give it a nice combustible mix in the Stirling engine combustion chamber, and it mechanically turns a shaft. So it is an engine that produces mechanical motion. It's not a battery powered uh, generator or motor. It is, it's a mechanical output from a combustion internal engine that turns a shaft that does in turn turn a DC generator that does make electricity. So whenever you read articles or talk to people about Sweden's Stirling engine, they will often combine these two things and say the Stirling engine creates electricity to turn uh, the main motor or charge the main battery, and they would be right. But an additional step that they often leave out is the Stirling engine is taking uh, this fuel and oxygen mix and turning it into mechanical energy first, which then turns a separate DC generator that does perform the, you know, make the electricity for the battery in the main motor. So this was the first of its type to come out like this. And that was in 1989. They had been testing it for a couple years, but they've really got it nailed down by 1989. So in 1990, uh, FMV awards the contract to Cockums and says, go ahead and make three of these, three Gotland class submarines, the Gotland, the Upland, and the Holland. So at the Malmo dry dock facilities, they begin upgrading them. And the upgrade of the dry dock facility is kind of an ongoing process. It's always being improved. And there's some times when they have more money and times when they don't have enough money. So I just want to give you a little picture here on the left of what it was like, you know, going through the 80s and building it up. And if you look on the right side on the bottom picture, you can see what they ended up with 
uh, today. So that's kind of the transition it's gone through. But they really had to make new tools and new equipment to build this new class of submarine. It was unlike anything that they had done before. Uh, it was a new shape, it was a new design, a new, a different size than what they had done in the past. And so they had to make the machines to make the new submarine during the years 1991, 1992. With the caveat of this is an ongoing process. This always is changing. During that time, and this really began in the 80s, the naval drawings from the technical schematics were finally finalized. They had many different versions of this Gotland class submarine, but they had to finally nail them down and say, we're sticking with this design because construction was beginning. And here you can see a nice little cutaway of uh, the sonar system, which is a cylinder and not a sphere up in the nose. It does have six torpedo tubes. Uh, there's four 53 centimeter torpedo tubes in the bow two uh, 40 centimeter torpedo tubes. And the 40 centimeter torpedo tubes are for smaller torpedoes and uh, mines, 40 centimeter mines. Uh, she can carry mines externally and we'll kind of go over that a little bit later. But here you get an idea of the layout of the submarine where the crew quarters are forward of the sail, the command and control center where all the ship systems are is just under the sail. The Sterling motor, which is the highlight of this submarine, that air independent motor, is uh, there after the sail. Notice that escape trunk after the sail too. That is uh, where divers and special forces can get in and out, just one of the ways that they can do that. Uh, they have the motor section just after that, and then the shaft in the engine room aft of the motor section there. All right, October 2nd, 1992, they finally laid the keel in a ceremony at Cockham's shipyard. Three years go by of constructing three different submarines until February 2nd comes along in 1995 and the Gotland launch ceremony is attended by the governor, Breggett Holkstrom, members of the municipal council, and the commander of the Gotland military command comes by for the launch ceremony of his namesake class submarine. And here's a picture of what they came up with. This is the unmodified version of the Gotland class here. Uh, you can see the six torpedo tubes up there in the bow. There's kind of an extra torpedo tube that's around the edge there that you kind of can't see on the left. Uh, but she is, you know, a pretty standard snub nose uh, submarine. Kind of pushes her way through the water. You can see uh, the, the flank sonar array there. Something that is special about this submarine is that it can rest on the bottom. Notice all the sealet inlets are well above the keel so that whenever she's sitting down on hard packed sand, she doesn't ingest much debris and uh, you know sand and mud into her systems. The X shape rudder on the back also gives her more clearance on the bottom so she can rest without sticking the rudder into the mud and potentially becoming stuck. All right. So let's go over some of the details of the Gotland class SSK. She's 60 meters long, just over six meters wide, displaces approximately 1600 tons. It's a lot closer to 1600 tons after her modification, but that'll get you in the ballpark there. She does have two MTU diesel engines. Those are marine engines. Those are normal diesel engines that operate just like any other diesel boat in the world. But she also has the two Cuckums V4, 275 Sterling AIP units, and those are the special air independent um, engines. Uh, she can do 20 knot surfaced, 11 knot submerged when she's using her diesel engines, and that's approximately 10 knots, nine to 10 knots, with her air independent drive. So if she's running really silent, she'll be just a hair under that 11 knot submerged, which would be her normal submerged operating envelope whenever she's on station. All right, over to the torpedo tube. She does have the 453 centimeter, like I said, uh, and the two 40 centimeter torpedo tubes, which fires a smaller torpedo and uh, mines. She can carry up to 48 mines external to the hull. So not in the torpedo room. They literally strap them on the hull and she can, you know, drive around in front of a target, uh, be it a, you know, a harbor or whatever she wants to mine, an area that, that she wants to deny the enemy and drop up to 48 sea mines. Uh, that is a lot of ordnance that this small submarine can carry. They do use the sonar CSU-90-2, uh, which is a very capable sonar system. It uses a syndrilic array instead of a sphere, uh, but still, you know, it's, it's, it, it's pretty sensitive. 
And uh, it's capable, is, it is as capable as, say, the Q5 was in, say, the 1980s. So, you know, comparable with NATO technology at the time. Uh, she has five officers standard and uh, 28 crew. Of course, these numbers kind of come and go as personnel rotate in and off the submarines. So very quiet, very capable, modern for its time, 1990s and, and two, early 2000s submarine. All right, so finally in 1996, the first Scotland class is commissioned in April and they have a little ceremony and you know that's fun for that day, but the very next day she gets right to work. And for the next eight years, she quietly patrols the Baltic Sea, she does sea trials, she gains experience and becomes more and more capable uh, without garnering much attention during this time. She's you know, out in the Norwegian Sea doing work, she's in the Baltic Sea doing work, and they're becoming very good at operating this new class of submarine that is quiet and capable, and the crew is becoming experienced. So in 2004, the United States Navy wants to run some war games against diesel boats. Of course, the United States Navy doesn't have diesel boats, so she has to lease one. And so they approach Sweden, uh, says, hey, we would like to lease a submarine with its crew for one year, station them out of San Diego, California, and have a two-year option on the backside, uh, you know, if things go well. Uh, Sweden and America do come to an agreement in 2005, and they lease the submarine for one year. And in 2006, they extend that lease. They use that two-year option. They extend it just for one more year, for a total of two years. And during this time, they do extensive war games. They do war games in different areas with different targets. Uh, but because she is so successful, uh, that is why she gets that extended lease. So let's talk a little bit about the war games that happened in 2005 that triggered this lease extension. Um, Oh, how do you get a submarine from Sweden to California? Well, being a diesel boat and with limited range, uh, she could, you know, transit the Atlantic and refuel in different ports, whether it's in Iceland, Greenland, Halifax, Canada, all up and down the eastern seaboard. But it would be more efficient to get her on board a naval transport ship like the ID. And that's what they did. They hired the ID um, you know, dry doctor above, you know, in the submersible dry dock ship that can transport it, you know, global range. And uh, they took her from Sweden to California there. And that's a picture of her in the bottom right. Uh, once she has reached San Diego, they're getting ready to submerge and um, get her over to her pier there. And if you look closely to the right of that picture, you can see the USS Ronald Reagan. And that's going to be the nuclear carrier that she's going to do war games with here in the new near future. All right, so the war games that took place 2005, 2006 were monumental. They really got the attention of the United States Navy. You can see the different operating areas there on the left-hand side. Now, of course, they did not use all these operating areas, and I cannot tell you which ones that they did use, but I thought it would be important for you to know uh, the naval operating and test ranges we have along the West Coast and over in Hawaii and around Japan up there. So in these operating areas, they conduct, conducted war games for... Uh, two years basically and during that time she took multiple photographs of uh, the carrier USS Ronald Reagan when she was doing operations with her simulating an attack each photo is essentially a torpedo attack and she did this over and over again evading helicopters uh, maritime patrol airplanes of course the picket defense ships the destroyers the cruisers the frigates that were around the carrier she got past all of them including other u.s nuclear submarines that were there as part of the war game and she took simulated uh, attacks on the on the ronald reagan and this really got everyone's attention we knew the united states navy suspected that there was vulnerabilities in our asw um, capabilities because the United States nuclear submarines would often do the same thing. You know, I was a part of many war games where we infiltrated and got near enough to the carrier to take a picture through the periscope. And that is considered a, su a successful attack in a war game environment. But the United States Navy has a problem with whenever she does, whenever we do war games with ourselves and we win, 
uh, we don't look at the vulnerability as much as we look at the victory. So whenever the United States nuclear submarine sinks a U.S. nuclear carrier, it's considered a win because our submarines are very good. The training is effective. Everything is positive. But nobody is really looking on the other side of things of, hey, how vulnerable is the carrier if this keeps happening game after game after war game? Well, this is one of the first uh, wake up calls the Admiralty got whenever we leased a diesel boat from another NATO nation, well, not even NATO, Sweden's not in NATO, but another nation, and saw how vulnerable our carriers are to a relatively inexpensive diesel boat. So this sent shockwaves around the Navy. This was finally the one time that they said, uh, you know, we're, we're very vulnerable, we've recognized this, and now what are we going to do about it? And we learned a lot over these two years working with the Gotland class or the Gotland itself uh, diesel boat. Uh, both sides benefited. Uh, the Gotland crew and captain got a lot of experience, and we got a lot better at ASW search and defense. Uh, we operated, it says there at the bottom, over different environments and conditions. In other words, they use multiple different operating areas, some with different bottom types, and then in different times of year, and in different weather conditions. So no two war games are ever exactly alike, even if they may be in the same location. So Gotland consistently performed well in all of these exercises. And this garnered um, the captain of the Gotland, Jens, Navkvist, and I hope he can help me uh, pronounce that name right someday. Jens uh, got a lot of uh, recognition and honor from the United States Navy, uh, even during these exercises, but especially afterwards. Uh, he was invited to, you know, a lot of dinners, a lot of meetings. They, Admiralty couldn't get enough information out of Captain Jens here. And uh, the crew was rewarded. Of course, they had an extra year in San Diego, California, which was fantastic for the crew. Um, Captain Jens uh, wasn't even a real full rank captain at the time. He ended up getting promoted to full bird captain. I believe they call it Commodore in the Swedish Royal Navy in 2013. He was uh, subsequently promoted to Rear Admiral in 2016. And he's currently in active duty as Chief of the Navy or Chief of Navy, if the translation is correct there, in, in 2019. So congratulations to Captain Jens. Uh, the man is a fantastic submarine captain, worthy of everyone's respect. He's very tactically capable. He's very aggressive. And his crew is very well trained and disciplined. So this man is the model of the modern submarine captain. And my, and my hat's off to him. I'd love to meet this man someday. This, this man is on a very short list of people I'd love to have dinner with. Captain Jens. All right, so let's move on to the midlife upgrade, which uh, began planning in 2013. Uh, they planned on doing upgrading two of the three Gotlin classes. Uh, in 2015, they did sign a contract. They being Cockums and Sweden came to an agreement for budgeting the upgrade at 2.1 billion Swedish kroner, which is about 2.2 billion American dollars uh, in 2015. Uh, the Gotland was finally upgraded. That's the first hull, Gotland Hull 1, uh, in June 2018. And Hull 2, the Upland, was finished upgrading and back at sea, back in service June of 2019. Uh, basically, the upgrade does a couple things, but one thing you can see right there in the third picture is that it extends the hull. They added a section to the hull uh, that's about two meters long. So they made everything else in the dimension of the submarine is the same, except she's a little bit longer now. And with that, displaces a little bit more, more water. So here's some pictures of her. Uh, some of the new equipment that they added was an upgraded Sterling Air Independent Drive Mark III. So just a new version of the AIP. Um, they increased her cooling. She did have a problem operating uh, in the Southern California waters and warm tropical waters. So one of the things that they addressed during this upgrade was uh, system cooling because it could get pretty hot inside the submarine. And more importantly, uh, op operating equipment tends to break whenever it gets too warm. So they, that, that was part of the uh, hull extension. Part of that was increased cooling and heat exchanging. Uh, they also replaced all of our mast sensors and antennas, uh, upgraded the, the sonar system, but it's still the same CSU-90. It's just upgraded to 2019 capabilities. This is back in 2015, but still same. Uh, 
It's just better now. Uh, they also added a little more room for special operations. Uh, I showed you in the beginning the uh, trunk that the special ops can get in and out of. That is still there, but they've added a little more space inside for crew comfort and for special operations equipment and people. And this overall change extended the life to out past 2025. We'll see how long she actually serves, but we expect her to serve well into 26, 26 and beyond. All right, so that is the Gotland class submarine. She is the pride of the Swedish Royal Navy and it is well-deserved. She has performed admirably and she is the model for future air independent propulsion systems in future uh, diesel, diesel submarines. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this briefing on the Gotland class submarine. I'm Captain Jive Turkey. I wanna say thank you again to every one of you patrons that are supporting me right now. Uh, you guys make this possible, and I could not be more grateful. I will work very hard to bring you quality subbrief content uh, from now on. And uh, you get, if you guys have any comments, recommendations, please leave them down there on the Patreon page, and I will read and respond to every one of them. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.